The Queen Mary II and the Queen Elizabeth II sailed together for just shy of five years before QE2 was retired from service in late 2008. During this time, the two liners were often compared. Well, over a decade later, and many people still compare QM2 to QE2. So let's look at the two ships in the ultimate and perhaps final battle of the transatlantic liners. Hi, I'm Chris Frame. I write maritime history books and lecture aboard cruise ships about maritime history. I also make YouTube videos on the topics of maritime history and cruising. If that sounds like the sort of thing you're interested in, please feel free to subscribe. It's nearly impossible to objectively compare ocean liners, as we all have our own measures of what is the best. Before we get started, I will declare my own bias. QE2 is my favourite ship of all time. QE2 was my first ship, and the ship that sparked my passion in ocean liner history. But QM2 is the first ship I transited the North Atlantic aboard. The first ship I experienced a Force 12 hurricane aboard. Ah, that's brilliant. And it has my absolute favourite lecture venue both on land or at sea, Illuminations. So I like both ships. With that out of the way, let's look at a few aspects of the two ships to see if one has the edge over the other. Let's look at their engines. While QM2 is the fastest ocean liner in service today, QE2 was actually faster. QE2's maximum service speed was 32.5 knots, while QM2's is just over 30 knots. QE2 was originally powered by unreliable steam turbines, but was re-engined as a diesel ship in 1987. This lifted her top speed to 34 knots, that's just over 62 kilometers an hour. QM2 on the other hand is more efficient and greener than QE2. QM2 is powered by a combination of diesel electric engines and gas turbines, and has recently had scrubbers installed to reduce her carbon footprint. QE2 had the largest propulsion motors of any passenger ship, each about the size of a London double-decker bus. QM2 on the other hand has the largest pods, each weigh about the same as a Boeing 747. Yes, you heard that right. Two of the pods can rotate 360 degrees, making the ship highly maneuverable. QE2 could go faster with just two propellers, while QM2 needs four pods to achieve a similar speed. But QM2 is double the tonnage of QE2, so there's a lot more ship to move. So for engineering, it sounds like a draw. QE2 was faster, but QM2 is more efficient, and certainly more reliable than QE2 was in her early days. QE2's engines are more powerful, but QM2 is arguably a more efficient ship, and with her pods, could run circles around the less maneuverable QE2. Let's look at the cabins. While QE2 was cutting edge in her day, much of the ship's accommodation can't compare to that offered aboard the newer QM2. I realise QE2 fans will probably turn off the video and protest right about now, but let me explain. QE2 had some fantastic accommodation. The grand suites, penthouses and grill suites on 1, 2 and 3 deck were among the finest to ever grace an Atlantic liner. They were spacious, well appointed and comfortable, and in many cases featured real wood, gold leaf ceilings and marble bathrooms. But even in many of these luxury cabins, there were no king or queen beds, single only, and only 32 cabins aboard QE2 had balconies. And most of the cabins aboard QE2 were not of this high-end grade. QE2's cabins were a delight for maritime enthusiasts due to their original fixtures and fittings as well as unique layouts. But with multiple categories and various shapes and sizes, many travellers in the 90s and 2000s found themselves a bit underwhelmed with their accommodation. QM2, on the other hand, has all the comforts of a modern hotel. Like for like, her cabins are larger than QE2's, and all of the twin share rooms can feature a queen bed. There's hundreds of balcony cabins aboard QM2, and all of the cabins share a familiar layout, as QM2's design is standardised. That said, you can argue that QM2's cabins lack the personality and individuality of QE2's, and aren't as exciting to explore. But just like staying in a luxury hotel on land, Customers these days generally want to know what they're paying for. So because of this, plus the higher balcony ratio and the queen beds, QM2's cabins prevail. What about amenities? QM2 is a bigger, newer ship, so she should easily win here, right? Well, not necessarily. It is true that QM2 has some amazing amenities. I mean, she has a seagoing planetarium, the first of its kind and the largest ever to go to sea. QM2 has a terrace show lounge multiple outdoor pools and a Canyon Ranch Spa Club aboard, as well as the largest library at sea. She's bigger, more spacious and more modern than QE2 in almost every aspect. But QE2's amenities could hold their own. In fact, many of the iconic Cunard signature rooms were created aboard QE2. QE2 introduced the Queen's Room Ballroom, which maintained its iconic 1960s honeycomb ceiling and floating wood dance floor throughout the ship's career. 
Chewie 2 also introduced the Queen's Grill and Princess Grill, both of which remained highly rated even after QM2 ended service. Chewie 2's 1994 refit saw the creation of the Chart Room Bar and the Golden Lion Pub, as well as a Yacht Club, spaces that have been copied aboard the existing Cunardas, but I'd argue were their best aboard QE2, particularly the pub and the yacht club. One of the nicest things about QE2 was the layout of the public spaces, which encouraged an intermingling of passengers and a natural flow. All of the public rooms were easy to access, and there was no need for bypassing corridors like those found aboard QM2 to access the Queen's room. Aboard QE2, there was plenty of seating, huge windows, and lots of little areas to relax in and enjoy the atmosphere of the ship. So this is a tough one, but I'd say that while QM2 has more amenities, QE2's layout pushes her just ahead of QM2 in terms of overall design. So we'll give this one to QE2 by a nose. Finally, let's take a look at their place in history. Now this is a tough one. QE2 is probably the most famous ocean liner of the last 50 years, but QM2 holds her own in this category too. QE2 was launched at a time when ocean liners were going out of vogue, but she was built as a floating resort meaning she could successfully cruise during the winter and maintain an Atlantic schedule in summer. Because of this, she ended up as the only liner to regularly ply the Atlantic from the 1970s until QM2 entered service. QE2 sailed 5.8 million miles. She carried 2.6 million passengers, including the Queen, Princess Diana, Nelson Mandela and the Queen Mother, as well as many other famous people. And she served as a troop carrier during the Falklands War. But QM2 is no slouch. She is the first ocean liner built in a generation, and the only one in service today. QM2 has attracted millions of onlookers, crossed the Atlantic hundreds of times, and also welcomed famous people aboard, including George Bush, Tony Blair, and the Queen. She is also the longest, widest, tallest, and most expensive ocean liner ever created, and at the time she entered service, she was the world's biggest passenger ship, an accolade never enjoyed by the smaller QE2. And as time passes by, QE2's fame fades, while QM2's grows meaning it is likely the two ships will end up about as famous as each other by the end of QM2's service career. Do you agree? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and thanks so much for watching. If you'd like to know more about ocean liner history, check out my maritime history playlist. And until next time, I hope to see you on board.